everyone. Welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm Jesse from the Gardener's Workshop. Today I'm sharing a recent Clubhouse chat with special guest Dave Dowling. In this episode, Dave outlined the basics for getting started with bulbs, perennials, and woodies as cut flower crops. This is a fast paced discussion with lots of questions from the audience. So you may want to listen more than once to soak it all in. I hope you enjoy. Welcome everybody to the Flower Farmer Show. My name is Lisa Mason Ziegler and I am joined here by team member Jesse Graven and Jesse and I are just thrilled today that Dave Dowling is going to be joining us. So if any of you guys have not, haven't, your paths haven't crossed with Dave, let me just give you basically a very quick overview. Dave you haven't heard all the good things about this good friend of mine. He is what I consider a world-class instructor. And what that means to me is that he has got such a, a teacher's heart. I mean, he is so very, very driven to do that. And he has loads of flower farmer knowledge. Um, he was a grower for over 20 years in Maryland, um, which is a mid-Atlantic on the East Coast, if you're not familiar. Um, and he grew in the field, in hoop houses, and in greenhouses. And he produced for year-round production, y'all. That means he was a member of that elite farmer's market for many, many years called um, the DuPont market, which is that kind of famous farmer's market that's right there in Washington, D.C. And I can still remember him talking about when he first started needing to grow year round and all the craziness he was going through to be able to do that. And he just became such a pro at all of that um, through the years. And in addition to being this incredible grower, he has also been involved in the major leadership of the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, even including being the president for at least two times. And, you know, the ASCFG is just nothing but a big old educational organization that anyone that's even thinking about growing cut flowers professionally needs to be a part of. Um, but anyway, Dave has been very, very active in that. And I see that Dave has joined us now. Hi, Dave. Welcome here today. So I was just kind of telling everybody about if they hadn't happened to have met up with you, who you were. And so today I've asked Dave to join us here because for a couple of reasons. Um, one is his course enrollment opens tomorrow morning and um, it's only open for five days and it's only open once a year. So we wanted to be sure that folks really had an understanding of what type of I mean, what the course is kind of about. And sometimes I think those of us that have been doing this for a long time assume a lot of things, and I am at the head of that line. And so I asked Dave to join me here on Clubhouse for us to first talk about, um, you know, what are bulbs, perennials, and woodies. And then I want us to talk about kind of what they kind of do for your business. So, Dave, First off, tell us what would you, how would you define what are bulbs? What kind of crops are those? And what would people expect to be in that group of flowers? Okay. Um, the bulbs can be different things. Some are a one time crop. In other words, you plant the bulb, you harvest it, and you're finished with that bulb until the, you buy new ones and plant new ones again. And the one time crop would be something like a tulip or a hyacinth where you don't save the bulb and regrow it again the following year. And then there's other ones that you would plant once and they can last for several years, like uh, narcissus or daffodils, grape hyacinths or muscaria would be in that category. They would come back every year for you. Alliums come back every year. Something like a dahlia is a tuber, but we consider, talk about it like as if it was a bulb. Those that come back year after year, but if you're in a colder climate, you need to dig them and store them for the winter because they can't take a winter much colder than like a 7B. Colder than that, they'll freeze in the ground and go bad. So those are some of the different bulbs that are grown as cut flowers. And so, all right, so because, you know, sometimes we just don't even think bulb when we think dahlia. And that's kind of want to just kind of to help people wrap their head around. This is a huge family of flowers, right? Dahlias are, yes, huge, huge number well, of I mean, varieties. Well, I mean, just bulbs, too. Oh, bulbs in right? general, yes. 
tons of different bulbs to grow, right? There are still bulbs that you talk about. I'm like, what bulb is that? I've never even heard of it. How did I miss that? And so then talk about perennials. Perennials are another just huge family. Yeah, perennials are all basically a plant that you plant once. It should come back to you for many years. There are some perennials that are wear out after five or six years. You need to replant them, but most of them will last for many, many years. Um, keep producing flowers year after year for 10, 15 years. Something like a peony will produce the rest of your life as long as it's in the right location in full sun. Um, you grow it in the shade, it's not going to do well. Um, things like phlox, that comes back year after year. Usually it doesn't ever wear out, so to speak. Um, some of the yarrows will last many years. I think we go over a little over 30 different perennial cut flowers in the class. So really the whole reason I've asked you this question is for this next group, because I think this is the group that most of us are not very familiar with. The course calls them woodies. So tell us, a woody is a shrub, right? Tell us about that whole kind of group of plants. And I think that that's probably the unexplored group of flowers for many of us. Right. Um, the woodies are basically shrubs that you use as a cut flower or sometimes a cut green or a foliage and sometimes just as a stick. You're not even selling it with leaves or flowers on it. An example of the one with no flowers and leaves would be uh, curly willow or pussy willow, which are very easy to grow in most of the world. Um, they grow from you know very cold zones, three up to zone eight and nine, they'll do okay. But they just are very easy to start new plants, easy to propagate, easy to have um, a whole row of those that you just pick on year after year after year. And they're very, very productive and can make a lot of money off of them. There are some growers who grow nothing but woody shrubs. And that includes things like lilac, hydrangea, nine bark, viburnum. A lot of people know about the grower in Canada, uh, Carl, with Green Park Nursery. All they grow is woodies. They don't do any perennials, no annuals. It's just they've created an entire business on growing woodies. So let's just talk about... I would like for you just to explore for just a minute, like what would moving into growing these different groups of flowers do for your business? It's like, I mean, the things that I think of is it would expand your business overall, but it just kind of, add, it kind of pads everything you're doing, right? It, it ups your volume. Kind of tell us what you see as the benefits of growers going into these other groups of plantings. Yeah, well, some of the perennials will be ready earlier in the season than anything you could plant each year. In other words, if you're growing just annuals, you're not going to have flowers until probably sometime in mid-June. Maybe you'd have some of the cool flowers ready earlier than that. But for the most part, you're not going to have flowers till summertime. Whereas if you grow some of the perennials, the peonies, uh, they're ready in late spring. The curly willow and pussy willow are ready in the spring. Some of the other early blooming uh Something like lilac, if you're in a cold enough area, they bloom a full month before peonies. So it gives you a longer harvest window or a longer time of the year that you can actually be harvesting and selling flowers. So it makes the difference of if you're just selling flowers in June, July, and August, and part of September till you get your frost, you're only selling four, maybe five months out of the year. But as soon as you add things like tulips that are gonna be blooming for you probably in April, then you got your lilac and your peonies, um, it just extends your season where now instead of selling flowers for five months out of the year, you might be selling for seven or as many as eight months out of the year. And just being able to have more months to sell your flowers means you can have more income and more income for your business lets you expand if you want to. Um, you know, it can be the difference of having work for your employees. If you're at the point we have employees, we can keep them employed for eight or nine or 10 months out of the year and they'll come back next year. And it's not like every year you have to hire somebody new and train somebody new every year. If you can keep them employed for most of the year, you are save so much time and effort by having the same employee with you year after year. You know, I was going to bring that up. That's such a great point. I think so much of how that's what drove Gretel and Steve of Sunny Meadows to really expand their business to the crazy level they're at now because they wanted to provide year-round employment. I think that's probably one of the untalked about really big benefits of when you grow your business beyond you, right? And then all of a sudden you have people helping you, but you're only producing or you only feel like you can employ them for six months out of the year. That is really hard to keep that person from year to year. And you're so really, really right. 
Yeah, it just makes it better if you can have that longer harvest window, longer sell, selling window to be able to either increase your income for the yearly income on your farm or be able to, to support and manage employees for most of the year. So Dave, I'm just wondering, what is the really big difference between, or what can folks expect when they start moving in, or what should they consider, I guess, as they start moving into these different groups of flowers, things that they might want to be considering? Um, for me, the first thought is if you're living or if you're farming on leased land, maybe not all of these might not be a good fit for you. That's what I'm kind of thinking about. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, one thing, if you're farming a land that's not yours and you're leasing it or renting a farm or just you know, renting your house that has some acreage and you're know, growing stuff for cut flowers, unless you know that you're going to have long-term access to that land, I would hesitate putting in expensive long-term crops that can't be moved. In other words, if you were to grow peonies on a leased farm, you can move those. Those aren't hard to move. But as soon as you start putting woody shrubs that ends up being a, a, a big shrub or a big bush, it's harder to move those in five or ten years if you end up finding your own farm to move to or just moving to a new location at leasing another spot. Um, something like a peony or some of the most of the other perennials, you can move them. Although I will say that Baptisia is pretty difficult to move. Once it's there for a couple of years, it grows almost like a, a solid mass of roots that are almost impossible to dig up. But, you know, if, if you're leasing land, I'd, I'd shy away from some of the woodies, except some of the ones that are very easy to start again. In other words, like the curly willow and pussy willow. You can start with new plants and even start plants from cuttings in the spring and have stuff to harvest that fall and the following spring. So it wouldn't be so bad leaving those behind if you had to relocate to a new farm and starting those again. But things like a limelight hydrangea, um, the nine bark, things like that, it takes a little longer to get those established and you wouldn't be moving those as you go to a new location, you'd be starting over again. But most of the perennials, if you had to move them, you could um, or start over new. The only one I wouldn't leave behind would be peonies because those do take two or three years before they start to produce. So you don't want to have to start over from scratch again. So you, if you did have a leased land and had to move, you would take your peonies with you, just dig the biggest chunk of soil with each one and replant them as a single plant. Don't divide them. And surprisingly, if you do that in the right time of the year when they're dormant in the fall or very early spring, they'll still produce the year that you transplant them as long as you move the entire huge root ball together. Wow. And so, you know, what are some other considerations people need that they'll be forced to think about? I mean, I would think about weed prevention, irrigation, finding yeah. a permanent spot on their farm. You know what I mean? Those kind yeah. of things. That's one important thing with both bulbs, woodies and perennials is that they're not in an area of the farm that you're going to till up or mow or or clear away every year like you do with your annuals where you might be have your zinnias and sunflowers and things like that. So you definitely want to put these in their own spot on the farm where they're more permanent so and they're not in the way of working the field, whether you're doing raised beds or tilling or no-till, whatever you're doing, you don't want to have this field of annuals and right in the smack in the middle of a bunch of flocks that you've got to work around every year. So you do want to segregate your annuals from your perennials or your woodies so they're a separate part of the farm um, or a separate part of the field. Um, irrigation is really important. Um, I like to say it's the cheapest in cheapest insurance you can get on a cut flower farm. I was talking to someone earlier today who planted stuff out in the field and have no irrigation on it. And she want, wanted to know why her plants were suffering. Well, it's because there's no water out in the middle of the field. Um, you know, you have to water the plants if you're growing uh, cut flowers. You can't rely on mother nature because mother nature doesn't always pull through for you. Weed prevention, if anybody has already been growing cut flowers or any kind of farming, you know, weeds are your most expensive hassle there is. Um, weed prevention is so much better than weed eradication. And prevention means you never let the weeds get established in the first place. Prevention means you go out there with a hoe or, or by hand on your hands and knees and pull the weeds. It's much better to prevent the weeds than to go out and try and remove them later. Um, so in the class, we talk about what perennials can be grown on landscape fabric and same with some of the woodies can be on landscape fabric for weed prevention. Um, and then what ones that have to be done with a mulch or really thick uh, compost layer to keep the weeds out. Um, we talked about flame weeding. People don't think about flame weeding, but flame weeding is a, a good alternative to get rid of weeds in new, newly planted beds or beds that are about to be planted. Um, another thing I want to point out is in the class, I've said we talked about over 30 perennials. You should never try and just start out, let's plant 30 new perennials this year, 
because you're gonna have 30 perennials full of weeds and neglect. Um, you always wanna work into it slowly. Start, I always say, start with peonies, get those planted as soon as possible once you have a cut flower farm. And then every year add three or four more perennials until you get all the ones that you wanna have. But don't try and plant them all at once. Um, it, it would just be overwhelming and you'd end up having a field full of weeds and have to start over again. As generally speaking, do florists tend to like lilacs from local growers? Yes, they will take the lilac from the local grower, but a trick with lilac is when you harvest them, you wanna harvest them when they're just starting to open. It should never be fully open on the plant. And then the other thing that's sometimes difficult to do is you want to, want to remove every leaf on that stem. You don't leave any leaves because then the water goes to the leaves and not the flower and the flowers don't last as long. So if you ever see commercially sold lilac, there is no leaves left on it. It's just a stem with the flower on the top. And the other thing you remember with lilac is they bloom on second year old wood. So this summer they're making the flower buds for next year. Um, so you never want to prune your lilac late in the summer. It's usually pruned as part of the harvest. And then all the new growth is what's going to flower for next year. But yeah, local florists will buy it. The trick also is it's usually a, a two week winter that you have local lilac. Um, you know, it's, it's blooming, you can hold it in the cooler for a few days and then boom, it's all done because now that's too hot and they've all bloomed out. So it's a very short uh, harvest window and sales window for lilac. I mentioned the grower in Canada that grows the lilac. He literally sells all of his lilac in one week. And he does a tractor trailer load full of lilac flowers every year and sells them in one week. Okay, so um, moving on to another question, um, and I think this kind of highlights something that we uh, don't often talk about that's uh, part of your course. Um, she says, can you recommend a reputable place to purchase peony roots uh, trying to get her ducks in a row? I think this applies to anything you're trying to buy. Um, one of the things that you talk about in the course is how to get into buying from wholesalers, right? Yeah, um, if you're doing this as a business, you should definitely be buying wholesale from commercial suppliers. You shouldn't be going to your local landscape, your local garden center and ordering stuff or buying from them. Um, if you buy commercial from a commercial wholesaler, you're going to pay a lot less. Um, but you do have to buy in the wholesale quantities, which means you can't just buy five peonies. You got to buy 25 of them. Um, you can't buy just 25. Uh, you can't just buy 25 tulips. You got to buy a bag of 100 or a whole crate of 500. But in the class, we do give a list of suppliers. Obviously, this is one that I work for, Ball Color Link or Ball Seed. They offer uh, peonies from several different suppliers. Um, but there's lots of places to go. Um, but the other thing is you want to order in advance. Usually, you would order peonies for planting in the fall. You'd order those in the summer because um, most of the growers or suppliers don't have excess. They just get in what they've already pre-sold. So then um, I had a, a follow up question about the irrigation. Uh, someone had asked if there is a particular type of irrigation that's better to use for woodies and perennials, for instance, drip tape or something like that. Uh, do we get into detail on that in the in the course? I only touch briefly on the things that need irrigation. I don't talk about how to set it up and how to, to put it in. Um, there is drip irrigation, which is what most cut flower growers use for things that are grown in a bed or in a row. But if you're doing woodies, often they'll use a, instead of drip irrigation, where it's a drip tape, where they'll just have a uh, half inch pipe or line that's still the poly, the plastic pipe, but they just have emitters at every shrub. So in other words, you're not watering the space in between, you're only watering right at each plant. Because sometimes the plants are 24 or 3 feet, 36 inches apart. There's no reason to water that empty space in between. So you would have a dripper or an emitter at each plant and not in between the plants. Right. And, you know, the uh, companies have experts on staff that can answer yes. questions that are specific to what you're growing. Right. There's a couple of big irrigation companies in the U.S. Dripworks and Berry Hill Irrigation are the two main ones. One's on the West Coast, one's on the East Coast. They can help you with anything you need as far as irrigation, as far as you know, the, the valves, the drip tape, if you need to have a filter, um, all kinds of stuff, they can help you figure that out. Um, there was someone that um, had asked uh, if you have uh, information about native plants that are good as cut flowers. We don't necessarily touch on native plants in the course. Is that right? Right. We don't touch on natives, but a lot of them are natives in different parts of the country. You know, native plants are very uh, regional based. In other words, there are some wild monardas that grow in New Jersey and Delaware. And there's some like Lysianthus, which is an annual, it's a native wildflower in Oklahoma and Texas. Um, but we don't 
separate out or point out which are native plants. We don't do that in the class, no. But there are native plants that work as cut flowers, but often if it's the original native that before it's been hybridized or improved, um, that they're often not as big and showy or as long lasting in the vase as the newer varieties. In other words, there's the native phlox, which I don't have three or four little florets on it, not the big, huge flower that you get with the newer varieties. Right, right. So, I mean, as far as vase life and stuff goes, um, with, with stuff like that, if you're not sure, I mean, you just have to test them, right? You have to I mean... test it, yep. Yeah, if you have natives mm -hmm. growing, um, the best thing to do is harvest them at the right stage and do a test in your own kitchen, on the kitchen counter and vase and see how long it lasts. Um, that's the best thing you can do. Yeah, so I was thinking, Dave, I think something that many of us, I wouldn't be aware of this if I wasn't so collect connected to Ellen Frost, is how much foliage is oh. actually sold to florists now and how yes. woodies um, and perennials can play a big role in that, right? Right. Ellen Frost is a florist in Baltimore that only uses locally grown flowers that are grown within 100 miles of her shop in Baltimore. And she's open year round in Baltimore zone seven. So it, it can be done in different parts of the country. You don't have to be in California to have flowers year round. But I know when I was selling to her and she'll tell you now that 30 to 40 percent of what she buys is not flowers. It is actually greens and fillers and other things that wouldn't be considered a flower. Things like Solomon seal or polygonatum. That is her favorite green and filler, and it's not a flower. Um, we talked about that in the class. Mountain mint is a great one. Some of the uh, shrubs, things like nine bark, it's just, you know, the burgundy dark colored leaf, um, smoke bush, they're all just leaves and fillers, but she buys them every single week. My favorite um, filler is eucalyptus, and you can grow that anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world. It just, it doesn't overwinter in zone seven and colder. So you grow it in a tunnel or just start new plants every year. But eucalyptus, every florist will use it. If you're growing for yourself and just selling your own bouquets and not selling to florists, it will still become one of your favorite fillers. It's just eucalyptus. And it's very easy to grow once it's growing. It's a very small seed, slow to grow, but you can start it from seed or buy plugs. And it's just, it's a filler. You'll be, find yourself wanting to use every day. I know when I had my farm and you were making a mixed bouquet, it was the first filler I would pick up before anything else, before the mountain mint, before any of the shrubs. The eucalyptus is a go-to. It's just amazing filler. I have to agree with that. I mean, you can always use eucalyptus. You just have to have enough of it, right? Right. It, I it, mean, it goes with anything. <laughs> It, it really, really does. And not to even mention that you can even dry it if you had to. You mean, you can right. keep it and use it later. Um, so, Dave, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think one of the things that I want to also point out is how perennials and particularly bulbs even can really help in the shoulder seasons, how, you know, growing in crates, and getting bulbs going to have that early, I mean, that's the highest demand, right? Is right. spring and then in fall. And I mean, can you talk about that just a little bit? I mean, anemones and ranunculus and tulips and- yep. Well, your biggest, your biggest flower holiday is Mother's Day. It's even bigger than Valentine's Day. And if you're growing out in an open field and growing annuals, you will most likely never have flowers for Mother's Day. But as soon as you start growing tulips and ranunculus and anemones, either in a tunnel or even an open field, if you're far enough south, you'll have flowers for Mother's Day. Um, even some of your cool flowers can make Mother's Day if you're a little bit warm enough. But just to have flowers for Mother's Day, to let that be your kickoff to start your season in early May, as opposed to having flowers starting in June, the amount of sales increase that can make is a huge amount. And the other thing is the sooner you have flowers available, the more you're going to sell later on. In other words, if you were going to be just starting to sell your flowers June 1st, and you might sell $500 the first week. But if you start selling flowers May 1st, by the time it comes around to June, you're going to be selling $1,000 a week. Just because people have been in the habit of buying from you, you have more to offer, you have more customers buying from you. The sooner you start in the year, the better the markets or your sales will be for the rest of that season. It's kind of like you get a kickstart earlier in the season. It helps the entire season be better. And, you know, Dave, I think something else that I wasn't really um, totally aware of, it happened to me, but I didn't plan it this way, 
when you start widening your diversity, you sell more to the same customers. Yes. Um, I like to compare it like if you take a group of people into Baskin Robbins, if they only had vanilla, not everybody wants that vanilla. But if you go in there and they got the 31 flavors, you're going to sell a lot more of it. So if you were growing callas and you only grew yellow, not everybody wants a yellow calla. You might sell to four or five people that day. But if you have yellow, pink, white, orange, and red, you might sell callas to 20 people that day. And the people who bought just the yellow now might buy a yellow, a pink, and a white. So the more you have to offer, the more you're going to sell overall, both to the existing customer, whether it's a florist, because the more you have to offer, the more they're going to buy, or just a regular uh, farmer's market or a, you know, a pick-your-own customer is going to buy more if you have more diversity and more things to offer. You know, I'm so glad you just mentioned Callas because you aren't going to believe this. So Dave, years and years ago, gosh, Dave, it's probably been over a decade ago that I bought Callas from mm -hmm. you that I grew in crates and they were gorgeous. They were amazingly productive. Well, we literally just kept one big pot of them hanging around here on the farm mm -hmm. and I just walked past that pot coming up here to do this. And those daggum deck cow lilies are still producing, but they don't produce as much now as they did the first time that I got them from you. And I want you to tell everybody why that is the treatment that yeah. is done to them to keep them producing from year to year. And friends, I just want to say, this is the kind of information you get only from Dave Dowling. Yeah. When you buy new calla bulbs from a supplier, especially a commercial supplier, like through ball that comes from Edney or a place like that, the new bulbs are treated with gibberellic acid, which the brand name is pro gib. And what that does is just a plant hormone that makes them put up more stems. In other words, if that bulb might have put up three or four stems because the uh, supplier treated with gibberellic acid, now it might put up eight or nine stems. But then what happens when you plant it in your field or in your, like Lisa has it in her pot, next year that bulb's not going to be treated. So instead of having the eight or nine stems it had this year, next year it might only put up three or four. You'll still get some flowers out of it, just not as many as if it was treated with a gibberellic acid. You can dig them up and retreat them yourself, or you can just let them grow and, you know, you get the two or three or four flowers a year off the bulb. It's up to you what you want to do. Some people grow the callas one time, throw them away and plant a new one. It all depends on the way you want to run your farm and how you want to do them. Um, I always grew them and then planted them in the field. I was zone 7B and they would often overwinter and let them just grow and bloom and do whatever they wanted and always bought new ones every year. Without that treatment, your bud count, your stem count goes way down. But you know, Dave, am I the only person that uses calla foliage? No, you can use the calla foliage. Um, as long as you leave, if you're trying to save the bulb for the next year, you just make sure you leave enough leaves on the plant to regenerate the bulb. But yeah, you can use the calla foliage. It's kind of interesting. Some are just plain green. Some have little silvery or gray speckles on them. But yeah, you can use the foliage for sure. I mean, it is um, really, really beautiful. And um, But I want to say that what Dave just told you about that treatment, when we first, the first year we grew them in crates, I mean, we did, we got exactly what he was saying. We got like eight to 10 stems per calla. Now I get three to four. Um, mm -hmm. And callas are an amazing crop to grow. And that's just one of many. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but that's just an example of the kind of information you learn about how you really do this profitably and do it like the pros do. So um, I did have a question about, uh, about gnats. Uh, so someone was asking about uh, gnats and some uh, crates that she was growing some bulbs in. Do you have any advice about gnats? The most likely fungus gnats. Um, that usually happens if you have a peat moss based growing substrate or soil that's got peat moss in it. They um, sometimes come with it. <laughs> Either their eggs are in there or they just appear out of nowhere. You can use a product called Natrol, G-N-A-T-R-O-L, as I think the way it's spelled. Um, it's just a liquid that you use to water them and to get it in the soil and it kills the, the larva. Um, another thing you do is put up the yellow sticky traps and catch the adults so they don't lay any more eggs. And you can also just slice a potato and put slices of potato in the soil and the little larva come up and are all over the potatoes in the morning and then throw the potato away. 
and that's a way to trap them, or you can use the natural to get rid of them. The, another way to help prevent it from happening in the first place is keep the surface of the soil dry. Um, so if you make sure you water early in the day so it dries on the surface, or if, it, if you need to, water from the bottom, if that's possible, so the surface stays dry, because then the gnats can't survive. The larvae would die in the dry soil at the top. So what I would like people to take away um, is that if you're interested in expanding your flower farm and business, you want to grow more to up your ante on your orders. Um, if it's time that you think that you're ready to invest in long-term perennials and woodies, I can wholeheartedly tell you that Dave's course would be the next step for you. And if you want to learn more about it, the registration does not open to the public until 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. The course is $595. There is a payment plan if you would like to do that. We would love to have you join us. Enrollment is only open until Monday at midnight. Class then starts the 1st of July. It's not literally the 1st, is it, Jesse? What is the it's, date? It's the first Friday after the 4th of July is when it is, oh, which this year that is July 8th. Um, so the course starts. The first classes are dropped into your online library the first Friday after 4th of July. And then for the next five Fridays, you get additional classes. Friends, you get over 16 hours of short sessions with Dave plus additional Q and A's from previous years. Um, you have lifetime access. You don't have to watch um, by any specific time. You can go in and watch certain sessions and skip over. Um, and then once a week during the school time of six weeks, you have a live Q and A with Dave each week, which is recorded and then also added into your library. Um, so it's like, so rich in information. And I would really recommend if you haven't already listened, we um, added to the Field and Garden podcast today, a podcast of me talking to Nicole Pitt of Flower Hill Farm in New York. Um, Nicole is one of our students and she talks about her experience with Dave's class, as well as how much she goes back and references it now that it's been a year or two, even since she took the class. So Dave, thanks so much for joining us here today and just kind of giving us a little looky inside the class and the types of things folks will learn about. Happy to be here. It's always good to talk with you guys. Thank you, everybody. And we hope to see you in school sometime soon. And thank you, Jesse, for all your help. My pleasure as always. Ciao. Bye-bye. I'd like to share a couple of notes. Um, from students about Dave Dowling's course, Perennials, Bulbs, Woodies, and more. So Sarah writes, whenever I need to make sure that my husband and I are on the same page about our perennials and bulbs, I suggest, hey, let's rewatch that section of Dave's course from last summer. Works like a charm. Just know that Dave has become our personal consultant. My husband and I are plant people and have gardened perennials for decades, but we never harvested a thing until two and a half years ago. Wow, it's a different game. This course was the best and it is so great to be able to refresh our memories whenever needed. Thank you. Signed, Sarah. And Crystal writes, I am taking your class right now. Incredible. It has already answered so many questions I had. Thank you for taking the time to make such an informative class. It has been awesome so far. Signed, Crystal. Friends, I just wanted to share um, these kinds of notes just make our hearts sing that we are inspiring and empowering other people um, to grow more. And we can do use more flowers in the world, friends. Okay, welcome back. So what did you think? Isn't Dave just an endless source of great information? Now, I want to remind you that Dave's six-week online course called Bulbs, Perennials, Woodies, and More has its annual enrollment window open right now in 2022, which is June 9th through the 13th. 
I have a link in the show notes to our registration page for the course. And I also included a link to the course discussions page, which is where you can find recordings of all of our recent talks, student interviews and such. And so I hope you check those out. There's also a link to Lisa's club on the Clubhouse app. We're over there live on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern if you want to join us sometime. So if you like what you're hearing here on the Field and Garden podcast, we'd love it if you'd tell a friend about us and leave a review for us wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jessie from the Gardener's Workshop, and I hope you have a great day. Mm -hmm.